Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I hope you are all healthy and staying safe during these difficult times. I'd like to welcome you all to what is sure to be a really wonderful event today. My name is Nancy Ippolito. I work for the Middle Children's Alliance. We also call ourselves Mecca. We're based in Berkeley, California. We've been here for 33 years. Uh, we focus our efforts on work in Palestine and Lebanon, uh, where we are fortunate enough to have staff and partners on the ground um, to oversee our projects, to provide feedback, to give us information regularly on what the current needs are and um, let us know how our programs are proceeding. So um, we support an array of programs, including projects for children, uh, one of our most popular is the Maya Project, bringing clean water to uh, schools in the Ga throughout the Gaza Strip. We also do a number of educational, cultural, and recreational initiatives for children. We um, have other kinds of programs like community income projects. And this year, because of the coronavirus, humanitarian aid has really taken center stage uh, in many of our programs. The need has been incredibly great and has um, uh, encouraged us to shift priorities and respond uh, to the uh, demand on the ground. Our support for these programs comes overwhelmingly from individuals. Um, some of whom are here today. We are so appreciative of the solidarity and generosity expressed by our community for, for all of this work. Um, I wanna thank our staff and our panelists for uh, coming together for this event. And I especially wanna thank our tech genius, Dean Barduka, uh, for putting this together. It wouldn't be happening without him, I think. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, Today's event is one we've been really looking forward to. Judy Kella and Reem Seal are two amazing food activists, chefs, and authors. And it's a real treat to have both of them in conversation today. Uh, this is also an opportunity for us at Mecca to deepen our relationship with Interlink Publishers, um, with whom we're producing this event. Uh, if you're not familiar with Interlink, I encourage you to go to their website and look at the amazing array of books that they published, uh, including two of Judy Cowley's books, uh, Palestine on a Plate and Baladi. Both of them are there. And those books are also available on Mecca's shopping web website called shoppalestine.org. I'd like to encourage you to go to that website as well. Um, and to say a bit more about Interlink, uh, Leila Mushabek, the uh, remarkable cookbook editor at Interlink, is going to say a few words. Unfortunately, she's not able to be with us in real time right now because she's in the middle of an intense snowstorm on the East Coast and is, uh, has sent us a video to use instead. So we're going to go ahead and show Leila on video. Hello everyone, um, my name is Leila Mushabek. I am cookbook editor at Interlink Books and, and um, we are an independent publishing house that focuses on books that promote cultural understanding, um, often from regions underrepresented in the American literary landscape. Um, and our cookbooks are not only beautiful collections of recipes, but also um, provide context into the cultures behind the cuisine through um, location photography, personal stories, food history. Um, and um, we had the great pleasure of publishing Sorry, everyone, give me one second and fixing something here.
Hello everyone, um, my name is Layla Mishabek. I am a cookbook editor at Interlink Books, and um, we are an independent publishing house that focuses on books that promote cultural understanding, um, often from regions underrepresented in the American literary landscape. Um, and our cookbooks are not only beautiful collections of recipes, but also um, provide context into the cultures behind the cuisine through um, location photography, personal stories, food history. Um, and um, we had the great pleasure of publishing Judy Kella's two incredible cookbooks, Palestine on a Plate and Baladi Palestine, um, which we are incredibly proud of. Um, We've also been delighted to work with Reem as well. Uh, she gave us an amazing recipe for Muhammad for our um, immigrant cookbook, which we published a couple of years ago. And I'm just, as a second generation Palestinian, I'm just so um, proud and grateful for the work that they do and really excited to hear their conversation today. Um, and of course, uh, we're just, you know, we have a long time relationship with Mecca as well. Uh, we've worked together on many, many author events over the years, as well as, you know, interlinked books are always present at their annual bazaar. Um, and um, we're just so delighted to be continuing that relationship. We have a book uh, coming out together in the spring called uh, Determined to Stay, Palestinian Youth Fight for Their Village. And um, we, um, it's about the day-to-day -day lives of Palestinian youth living to, under occupation. And we're uh, just delighted to be working together and continuing our collaboration. So I hope that you all enjoy the event today. Um, take care. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and now um, I, I just want to say our um, the book that uh, Layla referred to, "Determined to Stay: Palestinian Youth Fight for Their Village," is uh, a book written by Mecca staff member Jody Sobelauer and a project of Mecca's program called Teach Palestine. We expect the uh, book to be well. The publication date is May, so we're looking forward to having that book available and doing some events to promote it. So look for that in the future as well. And now for today's event, um, what we are all here for is to uh, hear Reem and Jody in conversation. They will be speaking for about 45 minutes and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. You should write them in the Q&A section. Um, and, um, Yes, Reem, uh, I just want to say a few words about Reem. She is a Palestinian Syrian chef based in Oakland, California, and owner of Reem's California, um, a nationally acclaimed restaurant. Inspired by Arab street corner bakeries and vibrant communities that surround them. Before dedicating herself to a culinary career, Reem spent over a decade as a community and labor organizer, building leadership in workers and in residents to fight for living wages, affordable housing, and a voice in their jobs and in their neighborhoods. Reem sits at the intersection of her three passions, food, community, and social justice. And she uses food to invoke the central virtue of her Arab culture, hospitality, to build strong, resilient, and connected communities. She's also the author of a forthcoming cookbook, Look for information on this in 2022. We're going to be sure to be promoting that as well and having events with Reem. Uh, about a year ago, we had our last live in-person event before shelter in place became the order of the day. And uh, we started having Zoom events. But that event featured Reem with a panel of other food justice activists. It was really a fabulous event that we held in San Francisco. Reem was not just a panelist at that event, but she was very much a part of creating the program and part of the vision that we at Mecca had of building towards a food sovereignty delegation. At the time, we had hoped that that delegation would go in 2021, uh, which of course is not happening uh, this year, but 
we, while we've put it on hold and we're not moving forward with that delegation immediately, we do, we're really hoping that this important issue will be on the agenda for us in 2022, possibly, and we'll be able to, you know, pursue this vision again. And now for just a quick look at Reem in her surroundings, we have a short video uh, and then Reem will, herself will take over. Thanks so much. Arab Americans post 9-11 started feeling singled out, started feeling different, started feeling shunned, ostracized. It changed the whole idea, the whole experience of being an Arab in America. It was actually physically dangerous to be seen or understood as an Arab walking through the streets of anywhere in the U.S. There were hate crimes happening all over the country. It was a time in my life in which I felt like maybe my life was at stake being outspoken about my Arab identity. I really wanted to educate people, but I didn't know how to find my voice. I feel like I lost it. For me, the backlash against me being Palestinian led to a deeper calling. I remember in the, while she was a leader at AROC, she talked about wanting to shift from paid work as an organizer to actually getting paid to do baking. Originally, I just wanted to put Arabs on the map. I thought my Palestinian activism was here on the side. I'm always going to fight for Palestine. And here's my food activism. It's about the culture. It's about the Arab world. And little did I know that actually those two things are very connected. The simple act of claiming foods, calling them Palestinian, celebrating them, telling the stories behind them, they're political. It was amazing to see the shift in sort of her energy, where she'd be on the streets mobilizing people, inspiring people to fight for their lives and dignity. And then to be in the kitchen and be so like scientific. So it's not that far-fetched to take the science of organizing and, and politics into the kitchen. As I started to get more and more into studying the food of my people, I discovered all these amazing techniques I wanted to mainstream the concept of Arab street food. We've been part of the cultural fabric of this country for so long, but because of the anti-Arab and xenophobic sentiment, we've never been able to sort of mainstream. I think that activism and food are connected in Reem's business in the same way that they're connected like in Reem's soul. When she decided to like go out on her own, she wanted to do it in the right way and in a way that really spoke to her values and spoke to her history. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us on a fabulous Sunday if you're in the US. Hopefully a fabulous Sunday if you're in other places of the world. <laughs> um, I am super excited today to have this conversation with Judy who uh, has been influential in my career, uh, in my journey um, as a chef and um, Hopefully many of you are familiar with uh, and have cooked from her unprecedented book, Palestine on a Plate. I certainly have. It's, uh, it's been one of my many Bibles in learning the cuisine. Um, and, you know, we're going to talk today about how it's had also a significant impact on um, just the world's understanding of Palestine and sort of what the significance of a book uh, like Palestine on a plate is. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Judy, uh, give a little brief introduction and um, show you a video just to get a flavor of uh, what to expect. And then we will uh, jump right into conversation. Um, so Judy is the author of the best selling books, Palestine on a Plate, Memories of My Mother's Kitchen. Um, and a second book, Baladi, A Celebration of Food from Land and Sea. Um, and she's been a chef uh, working for over 23 years. She was trained at London's prestigious Leith School of Food and Wine, and she's worked in numerous restaurants. Uh, she runs her own catering company and holds regular uh, sold out supper clubs, as well as hosting Palestine, Palestinian themed dinners and for charity. Um, she's also an amazing uh, teacher. 
and runs a lot of workshops. In fact, we just learned that she jumped right into this uh, from a three hour workshop she just did on Wada Anab. So I'm very jealous <laughs> of uh, what's cooking in her house right now. Um, but before we jump into our conversation, um, let's get a flavor for uh, Judy's awesome teaching. you how to make a really quick flatbread recipe for breakfast. We've got Lebne here on freshly baked homemade taboon bread. And then we're going to add on top cucumber, olives, lemon, tomato, just scatter everything as you like. And then we're going to add some dried mint and salt, olive oil, and there you have it, ready in one minute. <laughs> Who wants some uh, Lebne flatbread right now? <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful Sunday actually here. We just came back from the farmer's market and that's exactly what I wanted to do when I got home. So um, so thank you for being here with us. I know it's really late in the UK. What time is it over there? Eight o'clock? Uh, it's 8.20. No, it's still early. I'm not okay, five good. yet. Good. I know you're a while. <laughs> are still waiting till midnight. So we'll have to keep yeah. you... <laughs> Till midnight, I'm gonna eat a few 100%. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I wanted to just begin our conversation um, for folks who um, are less familiar with your uh, journey. Um, if you could tell us a little bit about what brought you to cookbook writing, sort of, you know, I just learned that you were a chef before this. And as someone who is just now pursuing a cookbook, I'm fascinated by this. I feel like I'm following in your footsteps. So if you can. Uh, yeah, share a little bit about what brought you to food and oh how that all started. <laughs> so many things, so many things. I think, um, so I always say the story, my mom always tells me that it's not true, but it's true. Uh, I'm the youngest of four sisters and my brother came after me and uh, I was so jealous that he was there because all the attention went to him. I became really reckless at home and just sort of terrorized everybody. And uh, my mom kind of just took me with her and kept me in the kitchen to distract me from trying to kill my brother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and really, I, you know, before all these words and terms came about, about anxiety and stress and depression and what have you, she kind of kept me in the kitchen to release my stress and anxiety. And I really loved it there. And, um, you know, obviously we grew up and things changed. I thought I, I loved art and history and architecture. And I studied this uh, in, in my A-levels, uh, which is before university. And then in university, I did a degree in architecture, art and design. And I realized really quite quickly into this that this is not what I wanted to do for my future. And I wanted to be a chef from a long time ago, but mm. back you know, 23 years ago, even more, um, it was not something, I guess, normal for a woman to mm -hmm. be in the kitchen. And my dad was really adamant that it was not going to happen. And... Mm. Uh, my mom eventually helped me kind of convince him to let me just at least go to chef school and try. Um, and I did it. I was in a really bad place in my life emotionally and mentally. And I loved the rigidity of it, if that's even a mm. right word. Strict and you had to be somewhere at a certain time, do something by something. Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of kept me in check. And I loved how my mind switched off, mm -hmm. right? Um, and um, it just sort of carried on and I thought I'm pretty convinced my dad was sure that I was never going to kind of keep up with this because it's long hours as you know uh, you know going to chef school is one thing and actually working in a kitchen is another thing you know it's 18 hour days if not more six days a week uh, and I loved it and I couldn't explain it to them I just needed that sort of army mentality and it was only really up until I worked with my last chef, um, David, who kind of really gave me the confidence to try something on my own. And I eventually opened my own restaurant and he helped me, uh, you know, get suppliers and really get into the food scene myself. And this is when I opened Beatty, 
uh, Beatty Kitchen, which was my restaurant. It was a Palestinian deli restaurant. And I kind of changed the menu every day because I didn't know what I wanted to cook. Mm. I just wanted to do whatever I wanted. And it worked in my favor because people were quite excited to come and see that the menu was different every single day and try new things. So it was an amazing opportunity to just recreate my mum's recipes and my aunties and grandmothers. And, and I started writing my book before it was even a book at this time. And then my restaurant had to close. So I was bankrupt and I had to start working in a property company. I told you we were speaking on the phone the other day and I had to wear, you know, skirts and a suit and high heels. And it just did not feel like me. I hated it, but I stayed there for a couple of years because I was really good at it. And I just sort of had to recoup. And I, I had already spoken to an agent, Heather who's still my agent till today. And, you know, she messaged me just like, what the hell's going on? This has been a long time. You haven't finished your manuscript and Middle Eastern food is, you know, kind of buzzing. Everyone's writing a book and yellow. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, get on it. Um, and I just said to her, like, I just got divorced. My dog died. My friend died. I lost my business. I'm starting a new job. And, and then halfway into my new job selling real estate I just thought no I can't wear this skirt anymore and these heels and brush my hair I want to keep my hair curly and just have it up and my chef's jacket I felt like I was betraying myself mm. and I just quit my job without having another job and I finished writing what is now Palestine on a plate but it didn't have a title at the time mm -hmm. it just was something you know random that was happening at this moment and then yeah we shopped it around nobody wanted it as Palestine on a plate they wanted it but with a different title not Palestine and you know at the time I was thinking do I want a book deal or do I want to talk about Palestine and mm. about Palestine was more important than a book deal because you yep. you find out soon books don't make us money mm -hmm. it's more about <laughs> i'm just gonna give you a heads up i <laughs> know i already know <laughs> no matter how many you sell it doesn't work in our favor but the point is is that it's something more of a family like a prestige thing or like a, uh, I don't have kids so this is my child yeah. and it's out in the world uh, that's more about what it is and i thought no i'm not gonna change the title and i right. wait and I got rejected by every single publisher. Were you given um, reasons? Did people yeah. flat out say we can't have it called Palestine on a plate? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was given reasons um, that, you know, Palestine doesn't exist. How can we write about a country that's not on the map? Are you actually Palestinian because you're born in Syria? Your passport says you're born in Damascus. I said, I have no problem that I'm born in Syria. I love Syria. I grew up there. My, we went there every year, but I'm Palestinian by blood. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And I just couldn't, it just didn't, re like, it didn't make sense in my head. I felt so much more Palestinian by being denied my identity at this time. And it just made me even more stubborn. And my publisher, not my publisher, my agent was just thinking, you know, what about this? What about that? We were trying to figure out ways. And I said to her, no, I, I prefer not to be published because I have a job, which I didn't mm. have. But <laughs> I, um, I prefer to not have this mm -hmm. um you watered down as some uh, like a middle eastern mm -hmm. general mm -hmm. book then to be what it was and eventually i met jackie small uh and she's an amazing woman i love her and uh, we had a lot of meetings she also wanted to learn about palestine she's so smart but again you know with you you know with the news and what's out there people have a preconception of what something is before it is what it is Right. and to educate them in a different way and even though I never I've never been to Palestine I am Palestinian to the core my mm -hmm. parents are Palestinian we grew up in a Palestinian home and I sent her videos and things on YouTube to see the tragedies that happened and also the beautiful things that happened in Palestine as well and eventually she said to me let's go for it but we're going to print a really small run 
just in case to cover ourselves uh, in case no one buys this book. And I said to her, trust me, everybody loves us except for mm -hmm. here and mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. where they are. And um, yeah, we don't want I, their money I, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's yeah, so much, but... yeah. There's so much packed in there. I mean, I think that um, sort of reading articles about, you know, all of the challenges you had in um, writing this book and all the backlash you received was right at the time that my restaurant um, was receiving backlash for um, me putting a Palestinian activist up on my wall. I, I, this um, is when I found out about you. I was reading stuff and I was like, this can't be happening just to me. It has to yeah. be other people as well. <laughs> and, it, and it makes me think about sort of, and I, I mean, two things. One, sort of following sort of your, your understanding or thinking is like, did I, I didn't open a restaurant to like you know be the food and wine top 10 whatever like I did it to put Palestinians on the map to put Arabs on the map uh to be a historical documentarian I mean that's essentially what we're doing and so I doubled down on Resmiya you know and that ended up actually uh benefiting me right and actually making me more successful and I think I think the same could be said about your book, right? Like it paved the path for other people like me or even for yourself, <laughs> you know, then to follow with other opportunities. And I think um, to, me, to, to me, it makes me reflect on sort of all of the work of generations before us and our generation, especially Palestinians in exile. That's what I call us because that's as best as I can call, but that there is a particular we're in exile, right? And so what is um, sort of the role that we play in the liberation of Palestine and the liberation of our people as a whole? And just like one art piece or one book can cause so much backlash that you think, yeah. oh, we must be doing something pretty historically unprecedented, right? Yeah. There's something really powerful in that. I was just actually talking to somebody about you yesterday after we spoke two days ago or three. I don't even know what time is anymore, by the way. COVID has ruined dates and times. Um, and they said to me, oh, she's the girl that has that poster, that painting, that portrait in her restaurant. That's how you, you're known. I'm and known. in one yeah. sphere, obviously also that you're a chef and you're an activist. I said to her, yeah, that's exactly who she is. And isn't it fantastic? They said, yes, it's amazing that she did it and she kept it and she doubled down. I think this should be both of our middle names. I'm doubling down on everything these days. I don't care what anyone says to me. Uh, if I believe it and I trust it and it's like in my gut, I'm going to go for it, no matter what anyone says to me. And I, you know, we were talking the other day and you mentioned how you were threatened and, you know, you were worried for your life. And I, ha I didn't have such a physical reaction to it because I was threatened on my phone, right? Mm -hmm. It was Which a real horrible. thing outside a restaurant because I had to close my business uh, in 2013 because of a rent and rates increase. But I was shocked. I've never, I'm not a good person on social media. I'm an empath. I absorb everyone's <laughs> energy. And when I saw these messages and I explained them to you, I'm not even going to go into them here because they're so graphic, but I, I was so traumatized by the things that people were messaging me. And we spoke about this the other day and what was happening to you and you were pregnant as well. And it's um, really frightening to think what kind of reaction we have on people just by being us and representing our country and our culture and our people and to see the the i i don't even know what it's like triple x rated <laughs> um abuse and it's not just like in a pornographic sense it's more of a violent um mm -hmm. thing. If, I, if i even thought about this before i wrote the book i don't think i would have written it because i really suffered emotionally a lot and my sister Maya was always telling me like these are just n keyboard ninjas like you don't even know who they are I said so, yeah but this is to me to me and they're writing it publicly and one yeah. rabbi a rabbi wrote an article about my breasts um I mean 
and I wrote him a message saying, thank you. Every, uh, you know, all, all, all publicity is good publicity, you know, but yep. you're a yeah, rabbi. But it hurts. Here, yeah. But it was so offensive. And I thought like, this is so degrading because there's so much more behind what you're doing and what I'm doing than to be, you know, just put into like a breast article or right. to uh, assume that you're supporting terrorism and mm -hmm. I think this is so dangerous because there's so much more to what we're doing and it frightens people who are against what we're doing and also shocks people who are sort of still in our sphere um, mm -hmm. and we spoke about this also that even with, within Palestinians that it's quite hard, a hard pill to swallow that some don't accept what we're doing because we were not born boots on the ground and I quote somebody who said this to me that I'm a hybrid not authentic Palestinian mm. but, you know, how many of us out there I think there's more than eight million of us mm -hmm. out Palestine and we we count for something because our grandparents mm -hmm. didn't you know, evacuate their homes in, in, in the risk of their life for us mm -hmm. to kind of just disappear into the background. Mm -hmm. Can you, you know? talk a little bit about um, sort of what, yeah, what was your family's journey and sort of how did that impact the food that you make? So my mom, my mom and dad's moms uh, fled to Syria and they ended up living in the same building together. And my parents met, I think, I mean, I could be wrong, but I think that they met living in the same building and they knew each other from birth, basically. And my grandmothers were in their mid to late forties at the time. They had 11 and nine children between them. And some of them stayed in Palestine because they were married. Um, uh, even though very young, they were married at 13, 14 back in the day and you know so we my grandmothers obviously had a very familiar food history with palestine but then obviously a very big syrian influence because this was their whole life was eventually there um and we used to go to syria every year to visit my grandparents and when i was young i remember and i again could be wrong because i've been reading some things about how our memories can be false mm -hmm. um and months and months in our summer holidays in Syria, uh, maybe three months a year. And um, our food was very heavily influenced by Syrian cuisine, but mm -hmm. in a Palestinian way, because my mm -hmm. grandmother would never let go of her Palestinian-ness, if that's even a mm -hmm. word. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, it's, um, again, all Palestinians who were exiled and evacuated and forced to flee have some kind of influence from Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, Egypt, America, wherever mm -hmm. they end up. So we can't kind of just delegitimize them because they were not able to stay. Mm -hmm. And this is and an argument that we have a lot is that um, Palestinians who stayed, you know, kind of just want to delete us that we left. We didn't leave by choice. And my grandmother didn't leave for us to kind of sit here and cry about it. She suffered something they suffer things we would never even be able to cope with probably in this time because we're kind of coddled and um, living in a different mindset of everything and we wouldn't have coped, I think. So I think doing these things is a um, tribute to them and to say thank you that we are kind of giving them their voice back even though they're not here anymore. And that is, you know, I think part of the the grand um, sort of uh, campaign to uh, ethnically cleanse us, which is is what you said, the sort of memories uh, dissipating, right? Like, um, I think for me, the, the first time I really understood my grandparents' story was after they passed a year ago. Both um, of them, they passed within 18 months of each other. And I was so sad because, you know, a lot of our families experienced the Nakba. You know, they experienced uh, that deep embedded trauma that had memories locked away, you know, mm. for a long time. And wasn't in actually until I was writing my cookbook and really trying to pull memories out of my mom or my uncles or, you know, these just like piecemeal memories to try to piece a story together about the atrocities they faced. And uh, 
that is part of the campaign, right? The more generations we go, um, the more we lose that so that it really helps in dehumanizing us. And I feel like our food is an oral history for us, right? Yeah, it is a I, way of- but I think you're maybe wrong in one instance that I think there was one, I can't remember who it was, this Israeli either like minister or army guy who said that the first generation, second generation, third generation, which is us would forget. I think they're wrong. We're yeah, we'll not, never forget. Yeah. Like, like we said before, we double double down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like can I say double downing? We're yeah. double, doubling down. Doubling <laughs> double, down. Yeah. <laughs> double, double down, yeah, not the right word. But doubling down on it because we're not going to forget the sacrifices for us to yeah. be alive. You know, it's not yeah. just write a book and cook delicious food. No. We're, we're we're recording history of their life. Yeah. Um even though we were, I'm sorry to hear about your grandparents uh, passing away. Mine passed away a long time ago, but you know, indirectly, I didn't realize how much of an effect it would have. Um, and it's so important. And this yeah. whole thing where this guy said, "Oh, the third generation will forget where they're from." Absolutely no. not. Sorry, my yeah. friend. Yeah, and we're going to remember even more, even though we can't step foot in this country. Right. We're going to go full force and. Yep. Um, yeah, and I think like we're going to preserve even the foods that can't be cooked back home because of the occupation, because of apartheid, all of those things. I think they didn't realize how resilient Palestinians are and that, you know, this is our tool. I mean, the pen is our sword, as Edward Said said, and but food is our, you know, our culture is our sword, our dance is our sword, all of the things, all of that supports the, pal the, the liberation struggle back home. And we need to continue to connect, right? If if anything, um, I wanna I wanna go back to uh, one thing you talked about. I mean, th this violence that you experience. I do think that there's something layered about being women in this industry. Like the gender component is a very important one, right? Um, you know what what does it mean to be a Palestinian woman? Like for me, uh, I got into the culinary <laughs> career quite late, much later in my life. You know, I was that prototype immigrant child that was like did what you know my it's the same yeah I know tell. it's <laughs> but you know my parents were worried they're like we didn't like fight to get here to the U.S. for you to have a low-paying job I mean you know our our work is thankless and uh yeah it's not forgiving we don't make money in it um and and yet we still do it and I always thought oh I had issues with like I never want to be in the kitchen I'm a feminist and then here I am in this industry where we are one of the few uh, women, women of color and Palestinian women. Like, how do you navigate that? And what are some of the challenges you've experienced uh, in doing so? I, when I worked in restaurants, I was pretty much the only woman that worked in the kitchens back then. Now everybody is a kind of mix, a mixed bag. But I was always the only woman in the kitchen. I found it fine initially and then it was very sexist I was always getting smacked on my butt and touched uh with a spatula or something you know and I really hated it and then one day I just literally took my knife and I just stuck it under someone's neck and I was like if you touch me again I'm going to slash you um because they didn't do it to each other and yeah. well, I'm standing here from 5 a.m. until 2 a.m. with you and I'm doing the same job you're doing probably better because I'm not drunk or high yeah and exactly yeah the reality is that there's a lot of stuff going on in kitchens I don't know now because I'm not in a public kitchen anymore but I was I felt so violated and so disrespected because I'm standing up cooking doing stuff properly and being treated like I was a toy in the kitchen and I hated it. And then this one moment, I mean, it happened many, many, many times. And then the last time I just thought, no, I'm just not gonna bite my lip and pretend this is normal. Because in any kind of job mm -hmm. environment, if someone did that to you, they would get fired immediately. But in a kitchen, mm -hmm. it's kind of, okay. And you know, let it slide, it's no problem. But it was a problem for me. 
Mm -hmm. And then when I, when I opened my own place very shortly after this last incident, I, I thought I would have just only women working for me. But in fact, I had 14 guys working for me and no girls, not for any reason, only because the application yeah. coming in and no one yep. email was joining. And um, it was great. Uh, there was no issues. And then obviously more girls started joining and it became, mm -hmm. it became better and the environment was nicer and kinder. And I think this is what I wanted always. And I remember actually all the guys that worked for me, they had like an intervention one morning because we had a meeting every other day at seven o'clock before the restaurant opened. And then they had an, uh, an in, a, like a meeting to me saying, you know, we don't respect you because you're so nice to us and you don't shout at us and you don't um, violate us. And I said, but you guys are all doing your job properly. So why would I break this boundary and uh, abuse you? Uh, and they were just looking at each other like, oh yeah, right. Because they'd worked in such toxic environments before. Mm -hmm. And here I learned from my last job that this is not the reality you can actually have a really positive environment in a kitchen and a restaurant and um you know i don't know about you but my staff didn't leave me for the whole time i was open for three mm -hmm. and a half years and these are like young people from mm -hmm. 18 17 till 20 and usually in restaurants you have like a kind of a lot of turnover yeah a lot of turnover and I said to them, I don't need to shout at you because you're all working together you create your own rotors and you're fine and and I felt really um, good that I changed the atmosphere in my place to not be uncomfortable for anyone that was working there, a woman or a guy or a man. And, and it was a proud moment for me, even though they told me that you're the worst boss because I was too kind. And I was like, what? <laughs> I really... Mama but Judy. I... Yeah, yeah, Mama <laughs> you're all here still and we're all on good terms and everything is flowing smoothly so I think it was I learned a lot working in 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 these sort of different kitchens that I did for a long time and mm -hmm. it really kind of gave me a thick skin and I remember talking to you just the other day saying I don't want to have a thick skin I want to be just me with my normal skin not having mm -hmm. to be tough and constantly fighting all the time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It changes you and I don't want to be that person I want to be me and be mm -hmm. okay and not have to worry that someone's going to violate my space and mm -hmm. change who I am so yeah yeah I think so like just going back to the personal like you know you speak to this idea of we just want like food spaces are actually could be quite liberating right they take us uh I I really resonated when you were like it just very disciplined and takes you out of your head and into your body and for yeah. a lot of us traumatized people that is actually a very healing process to be out of our head and into our body you know like one of the greatest joys is for me is like kneading my dough you know i love kneading my dough i love watching people eat my manusha it's like these simple uh like so simple you know back to hum humanity and um, we always talk at Reims about Arab hospitality is about letting everyone in. It's not an exclusionary settler colonial <laughs> concept like what is being imposed on us. And um, I I'm just curious sort of around sort of your relationship to food and what was it like on a personal level to write these stories in your cookbook to recipe tests? Like, yeah, take us through that process. It's so... I, I don't really know how to answer this because I um, I sort of upscaled all my recipes to fit my restaurant because I was cooking yep. alone. And I thought I, <laughs> I told you I was. The you have to scale them back down. <laughs> I was the cleaner, the accountant, the chef, uh, the sous chef, the dishwasher, everything, and a manager and general. Ma I, I was doing everything, and I had everybody in their job, but I still did all those jobs anyway. And I had a bit of an issue of control because mm -hmm. I didn't want it to fail. I spent mm -hmm. all my money and my dad, actually, he, he invested in me and I didn't want to let anyone down. So I just doubled down on myself and mm -hmm. went full throttle. And obviously, you know what that's like. It's exhausting. Mm -hmm. It's not it's exhausting. Achievable because you can't do everything. 
And I started to write the recipes in bulk form for one guy. I eventually hired this lovely Polish guy who didn't speak a word of English, but he was like militant. He, he would watch me and re recreate everything I was doing. And we couldn't speak the same language. I mean, he did not speak English. I didn't speak Polish. And we would just do sign language to each other. I'm like, this, 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 this. And then I started writing stuff because he started learning how to speak English. And this is when I started writing all the recipes down because I would cook. I don't know about you, but I cook with my eyes. I don't mm -hmm. know the recipes. Even now, today with the cooking mm -hmm. class, someone, mm -hmm. how much rice are you putting? A little bit like, of this. Look at the recipe I send you. I'm doing it by <laughs> eye. <laughs> because I don't measure anymore. I, when I never measured anyway. I just did things how my mom taught me to taste, touch, and feel. And, mm -hmm. um, and then I had to scale everything down when Heather said to me listen I need this manuscript uh, it's, it doesn't work like this you can't have like 50 chickens it's got to be mm -hmm. one chicken mm -hmm. um, and and then me and my mom my mom by the way came to my restaurant every single day uh, it was open for three and a half years and I love her she's the most amazing person. She didn't even have to come because you know she knows how to cook, and she would eat every day um, something there. And we, after the restaurant closed, I had more time in the evenings because I finished my new job at like eight p.m. and I'd go to her house and I'd sit and talk to her and tell her how to do this recipe in in a smaller format, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know what happened is that my mom started remembering things that she had forgotten because she had not been sort of poked about these things for such a long time she was cooking sort of the generic 25 things over the last 40 years mm -hmm. and then I said to her but what about this and what about this and she said oh my god let me call auntie Noha let me call auntie Shahla auntie, Nova, auntie Dunya auntie whatever <laughs> and she has nine sisters and my dad has seven so they were calling Fathiya, Nazniya, Rasmiya, Saadiya and everybody and they got so involved in it. That's great, though. It's like communal, you know? Yeah, but this is it, exactly what it is. It was a communal historical uh, memory. And Auntie Lamia was remembering basada, which is something she hasn't cooked in so long. And it's actually a very old recipe that people don't cook anymore. And she's like, put this in your book. Um, mm -hmm. And you have to. And I was like, but no one knows it. I've never had it before. She's like, no, no, no. You will remember. People will remember this. And it, it it really made them excited and so invigorated and alive um and i loved it uh because i didn't know these dishes i mean i knew most of them but a lot mm -hmm. of them i didn't know and to see them sort of just come to life remembering and it created this like storm of conversations between them yeah and that's great they so involved and really the book is about them i mean it's not yeah. me i yeah. knew the recipes but I'm not, I'm not most of the recipes. It's them right. and bringing, bringing a celebration of their life back to the forefront and right. celebrating it and putting it on a yeah. like culinary map was so important. Um, and I'm sure you know what it feels like. You're writing yeah. your own. So my mom was so like honored that I, she was yeah. even going to get a space in the cookbook. And that's like our generation before us is, not used to this and we are conduits, right? You're a facilitator of that. Um, I want to move to a little bit of a, you know, uh, in the forefront uh, conversations about sort of the role of food sovereignty, right? And um, in, okay. in the way that I talk about food sovereignty is our right to access food that is culturally relevant, our right to claim ownership and labor and narrative over our foods. Uh, and we know as a Palestinian people that that, you know, that that hasn't been the case for us for a lot, you know, in this world, our foods have been claimed as, well, they've either been de-ethnicized, right, like completely disappeared into the <laughs> landscape of the Western eye, right? Hummus is just Trader Joe's. It's not, our, oh I don't know what the UK equivalent is, but, or they've been claimed by Israelis, right? The Israelis have, um, spent millions and millions of dollars into programs of gastro diplomacy to get yeah. influencers, many other like renowned chefs of color, even like people who would, you would expect to be on our side 
are getting hosted um, and all in an effort to normalize, right? No, we um, cannot normalize. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So could, tell me about that. Like, what? how have you navigated those spheres? Have you been around other, uh, and I'm talking particularly people in our uh, industry that would be our likely allies. <laughs> I call it like progressive except for Palestine. Like they're progressive yeah. on everything else. They're all about Black Lives Matter, all of these things. But then when it comes to Palestinian food, there's there's a challenge there. Yeah. How do you navigate those spaces? <laughs> for the last five minutes, I want to end on the challenge. <laughs> Tonight, we're staying here for two hours. <laughs> Basically, Reem, I'm going to say a few things. One, yeah. we have to remember also in historical times when our grandparents were in Palestine, obviously there were Jew Jews living in Palestine and they yes. ate our food, right? Yep. And this is one thing. And it was Palestinian food they were eating. Then obviously with the occupation and then the dis disaster, destruction of Palestine, the exile and the exodus of Palestinians, Obviously, Israel was created and then all our history suddenly was just erased with a rubber and Israeli food sort of came about, which is so offensive. Um, and again, I'm not going to like delete every Israeli here because there are so many Israelis who are living there before who were not Israeli, who are just Arab Jews living in Palestine. And we cannot just delete the fact that they live there and live, ate, our, ate the food that we ate. Right, so we have to be kind of sensitive to this subject, but to change this and make it Israeli msakhan and ma'lube and the za'atar and the hummus and the msabaha and what have you, to, to just completely eradicate the historical connection to the people of this land and make it something new that happened in 1948 from Eastern European Jews is not okay. But then to have Palestinians or brown people, if you want to just put it under this label, is um, who are sort of working with Israeli chefs to normalize what's happening is not okay. I'm going to put my hand up here. I also, myself and five or six other Palestinian chefs were part of a, a non-Israeli um, cookbook and we all got completely, excuse my language, there's no other word, we got screwed over and we, we all started speaking to each other saying, you know, what just happened here? This is not what was proposed to us. The book got published and printed without even our consent. We didn't even see prep of the book, which is what usually happens when a book is being printed. You see it and, you know, I spoke to one of the people and they said, oh, in Israel, this is what we do. It's okay. And I, <laughs> but that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything because in the rest of the world, it's not okay. So, sorry, Electra. Sorry, I have two dogs on the side. And, They're upset uh, about this, like you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in this moment, I suddenly realized that not everybody who has a, sorry, one second, Electra. <laughs> um, not everybody who has the same um, you know vision as us is also on our side and you know this guy was like oh I, I gave up my Israeli nationality and I this it doesn't mean anything because at the end of the day a, a lot of Israelis need Palestinians to normalize what's happening and this is the problem we think that we need them but they actually need us to make mm -hmm. them legitimate in this sense and again, this is not with every Israeli, so we don't want to create this massive divide because I have a very good Israeli friend who is Israeli by birth, but Yemeni, Iraqi, Syrian, Armenian, Turkish, you know, mix of everything, but Israeli because his parents were born, uh, um, he mm -hmm. was born in Israel, even though they were not, but he recognizes his food is not Israeli. It's all these cultures, but he's just an Israeli national. Um, mm -hmm. But we have to kind of not cross over lines so much. But on the other side, when we have Palestinians who are normalizing things, again, I feel like I can't speak so much about this because I also put myself in this bad situation. Mm -hmm. But I learned in hindsight that it was such a mistake. Um, it's wrong. We have mm -hmm. to kind of just realize we are powerful enough on our own. Mm -hmm. And obviously, 
you know, I tell all my students online, through your failures, you find yourself and mm -hmm. you learn to be more confident because when you make a mistake, you'll never make it again mm -hmm. because A, it takes time, it costs money mm -hmm. and it's frustrating. So, and this goes in every aspect of life. And it's again, right. this normalizing. And again, it's not just making a gag or uh, malube mm -hmm. or what I have. It's in every aspect of life that when you make mm -hmm. a mistake, you recognize what's happened, you rectify it, and you never make this mistake again. And mm -hmm. I think we have to be together more than we are separate. And a lot of yeah. Palestinians I've encountered are not doing that. And I feel guilty saying that because I was part of something that was such mm -hmm. a backlash on me, but it mm -hmm. was um, a big wake up. It was eye-opening. Yeah. And I think like <laughs> when you get to be in this caliber and such a public figure, you're going to have that, you know, and there's all these landmines you're going to have to navigate. And I think you know, for me, uh, just personally speaking, because of my organizing background or I'm part of movement <laughs> around me, that helps keep me accountable. And I think that, you know, is part of the work that even as we're sort of sitting in our sphere in the food world, that we're connected to people on the ground doing the work and that, you know, our communities will hold us accountable. And yeah, oh we're better goodness. coordinated. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we're better coordinated than we are sort of divided against one another. So I really appreciate um, your perspective it's, there. It's really important. It's really important that we get put back in check, but in a in a good way, not to kind of cut you at your knees and crucify yeah. you. You know, exactly. be allowed to make a mistake and learn from it, but yeah. so to grow from it, yeah. right? Exactly. Be buried after you've done one thing wrong because... yeah we have an illusion because I don't know about you but I'm very kind of hippie and I want to think everyone loves everybody obviously yeah. this is not reality but yeah yeah I want to believe that it's like this and it yeah. can be like this so we can sometimes slip up and make a mistake and yeah we're vulnerable we are human <laughs> want to see the good in everybody because yeah if see the bad then what's the point of doing anything that we're doing it doesn't make yeah. sense I mean, we're, co we're cognizant of the systems of white supremacy, but we still believe that one day there'll be a democratic Palestine with Jews and Muslims and atheists and whoever living side by side with one another. There's nothing wrong with that vision. That's what keeps us going. So, I, I, yeah. I, I think <laughs> it's like one, one step closer to something that is yeah. more realistic than what's happening now. And we have to, you know, work our hardest to make something positive happen mm. even if it's not happening on the ground yes in ourselves you know it's, yeah yeah if we don't stick with each other who's gonna stick with us yeah um but that's it, awesome yeah well it, thank you <laughs> thank you so much this has like been amazing i see questions and answers sort of trickling in if folks have questions we're gonna move to uh, q a but before we do that i um want to just remind folks you know today we're we're here we're celebrating the food of palestine but also we're talking about a very serious um you know hunger crisis in Gaza uh, and around the world and as folks know that the israeli occupation and the blockade has really devastated the economy over there um and you know, add COVID. I, I, I saw uh, um, something in SNL today where they are last night where they announced that the vaccine is 50% uh, of Israel has been given the vaccine now. And the joke was, I bet you it's the Jewish side. <laughs> so yeah. even SNL has caught on to this. But, you know, COVID has well, obviously I mean, I'm exacerbated. I'm laughing. I'm laughing from anxiety and nervousness. But yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's not really sad. Joke. Yeah. Sad. I mean, there's large numbers of children, they're suffering from anemia, from developmental disorders. And, um, you know, for this reason, uh, I'm really excited to be supporting Mecca. They've started yeah. this project to bring healthy and fresh meals, um, particularly to kindergartens in Gaza. We know that um, the youngest in Gaza now are the most disproportionately impacted. And, um, you know, they're, basically delivering parcels uh, to thousands of most vulnerable families. And I think each parcel costs about $40 and mm -hmm. it lasts the family several weeks. Um, 
So I know everybody is, uh, you know, maybe donated $10 to come and see us talk, but I want to ask folks if you feel so willing, um, even to give just a little bit more, you know, give it could more, make a huge difference. <laughs> Don't <laughs> you know, be shy. <laughs> you know, if $40 is one parcel, if you give $120, you'll be feeding multiple families, but whatever you feel sort of compelled to give. Um, I really encourage you to to do I so. Um, see, we can. There's a. a oh, good. They put the website. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Please uh, check out the website. I think they put it in the in the chat. If you feel compelled to give, um, and thank you, you so much help. for just. Don't be so polite, Reem. <laughs> yes. Yes. Give. <laughs> it's 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 <laughs> imperative to give to learn from these conversations, but also to act. Uh, with your hand and your pocketbook. So yeah. um, so I see some questions and answers trickling in and I want to give a chance for folks. Oh, where um, are you seeing this? Am I missing? Yeah, there's a there's a little Q &A, um, and A. Ah, and okay. uh, I'll, I'll kind of just walk through these. Um, I, this is a, a great one in terms of, um, we'll, we'll start with an easier one on the importance or not importance of sourcing quality ingredients so you know we talk about like for me at uh, reams we we do talk about sort of the importance of cooking traditional palestinian foods but also um you know paying homage to the lands we live on which is stolen land as well right the, uh, these are ohlone lands um there are people of color cultivating these lands many of them um, really exploited. And so we go out of our way to really think about the ingredients we source and where. Um, do you want to talk a little bit uh, to sort of what your thoughts are on sourcing? I, yeah, I think it's really important to, to, to go back and source things from back home. We have so many amazing products. One company that I, there are many, so please don't think this is just the only one, but this is one that I've used since when I had my restaurant, before I had them, they were a young company then. It's called Zaytun.org. Um, and um, it's uh, an amazing, amazing company where they utilize, uh, you know, the, the, the experience of women who are living in Palestine to uh get their crops for zatar and frike dates almonds nuts olive oil and so on and their produce is fantastic and a lot of things are organic as well because they're not using pesticides as much as possible but it's um giving back to the community right you know i can buy olive oil from a super local supermarket that's from italy or greece or spain which is fantastic again we don't want to like just delete mm -hmm. other countries but if you can support your own local uh, country um then why not you know this mm -hmm. is giving a livelihood to somebody else who's in a less fortunate situation than somebody who's living in spain or france or italy uh and and just embrace it and also you'll notice the flavor reem you you're probably mm -hmm. using things from palestinian distributors mm -hmm. you'll notice the difference from if i go mm -hmm. to a like a local supermarket and buy a zatad. Honestly, I don't want to sound disrespectful, but it's like when you dust your house with a broom and <laughs> all the crust that you find, and that's what they've put in a jar and they're selling yeah, it. And they're, 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 they're profiting off of it. <laughs> yeah, zatad or Jordanian zatad or whatever yes. you want to call it. Yeah. Then it's like this once you open the packet, the, the, yeah. the smell just kind of takes you somewhere even if you've never been to these countries you just automatically feel like you've gone back so mm -hmm. i think it's important to spend a little bit extra to get mm -hmm. the original feel otherwise you're going to be adding so many things to your dishes to make them feel authentic when they're not mm -hmm. well at least here in california we're very lucky in the bay area because the the, the climate as much like it was back in Palestine, right? So like we have this fun medium of really using zatar from the homeland, but maybe we'll use California olive oil, right? Because that is, and cultivated by producers, local farmers, folks who are trying to make a living for themselves, uh, which is equally as important to us. So yeah. sort of supporting the global and the local um, at the same time and, and, and creating these thriving ecosystems because we know yeah. that so the food system is really 
not set up to support, uh, you know, as particularly black and indigenous and people of yeah. color here. So um, I see a, a bunch of questions on uh, Yotam on Odalenge's work. So I'm going to bring it up here <laughs> since they're in the UK, right? Sammy and, and yeah, Yotam. Yeah. Um, so I, I'll just sort of read these, these questions. <laughs> huh? Can I ask you this question? <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, we can, we can both answer it. What's the language what is, that Mimi helped put Palestinian food on the map? Yeah. What do you think? Oh, you're going to put it on me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Did they put it on the map? No, that's, uh, yeah, I, uh, not at all. And uh, I think... So when Yota Mantelengi, the, the like Jerusalem books came out, um, I think I, I had a really visceral reaction um, to that at the time. Um, one, because I didn't know Sami Tamimi, who for folks who don't know, uh, is also a Palestinian chef and business partner of Otolengi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that they had co-wrote that book. Like you wouldn't have been able to tell. Um, Odalengi's name was front and center, um, and whether he wanted to or not, whether they called food Palestinian in that book or not, it became sort of the gateway to sort of the Israeli food uh, craze here in this country. And it made me really sad because the food is really delicious in that book. <laughs> I always say when the colonizers cook your food so good, it just makes me even more angry. <laughs> Um, but that why why is it that we finally got sort of this spotlight for our food that and is really had to be the spokesperson? So it's not so much an affront on him personally because I know in reading his book and I remember that he was on a show uh, with Anthony Bourdain taking him through Palestine and talking about the nuances of Palestinian food um, that uh, that it was bigger than just him, but. Um, in a way, I'm angry because I don't see Yotam like out there outspoken against food appropriation in the same way. And so I think that it's a really dangerous line to play mm -hmm. um, to being the spokesperson. And, and it's, you know, I think, um, I, re I don't remember if it was an excerpt in Jerusalem or one of his other books, he, you know, he said, uh, you know, I can't remember exactly, but the gist of the excerpt was like, we all have more in common than we uh, have difference. And to me, I don't really, my friend Leila Haddad, who's also a cookbook author, she calls this like hummus kumbaya. <laughs> and it, it really deducts uh, the, it deduces the issue and, and oversimplifies it. It's like, yes, we may eat the same food, but we are not the same people. You know, and it really sort of takes away the narrative of what actually happened for us to eat those same food. Um, yeah, and so I, that is my issue. It's more the context in which the cuisine is introduced. Yeah. I th Listen, I've worked with both Sami as a friend of mine and Otolengi. I worked in his restaurant because me and Sami did a Palestinian takeover for London Food Month a couple of years ago. And you know, Yotam is very much embracing the Palestinian culture because Sami is his business partner for more than 15 uh -huh. years, I think, 15 years, if I'm not wrong. Uh -huh. But I think also, again, it's just like, why do we need someone else to verify who we are by saying, because Israeli food and Israeli narrative is so much stronger because again, you mentioned this influx of money being put into their food industry and mm -hmm. thank you to the US and UK. And we had a huge campaign in Waitrose, which is a big, big supermarket here. And, and they did a massive campaign on Israeli food and it really backlashed a lot, not mm -hmm. because, People are racist against Israelis, but they recognize the food to be Palestinian. And they were just like, hold on, this is not correct. Um, but I think it's, I'm kind of fed up of someone else having to verify us mm -hmm. as a people and a culture and a food uh, instead of us, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm pretty much over it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know what to say more than this. And I think, 
I think the best person to represent and speak about their food is the person that comes from the country itself and their families that grew up there, not taking away that obviously these Israelis have come from Eastern Europe and settled and they lived there for the last 70 years. But there was people that lived there for thousands of years before. (laughs) We have a voice that is a little bit more important because of our historical connection to this land and Mm -hmm. it's not taking away from them it's just saying hey you got this stuff from us (laughs) so Mm -hmm. give credit where it's due Mm -hmm. um and I, I I was really very kind of politically correct and then I thought no I'm not gonna be offensive but I'm gonna say the truth and if someone doesn't like it they're not even when I was politically correct I was getting attacked to get raped and murdered so I thought if I'm being PC and accused of this and threatened of this then I might as well speak really what's inside me and get threatened for these things which is what I prefer I prefer you know to say everything inside me but I yeah you're right the recipes in that book are really good (laughs) (laughs) I'm like and our yes. recipes are just as our good. Recipes are just as good. Yeah, I mean, and I think that it just means that we need to have more of a um, what's the word? Reem, tell me. We need to have more of an impact on our yeah. news. Like for he, for me here in the UK, the news. You know, we need the papers to write about us, right? Because that's mm-hmm. how people get to know about us. Mm-hmm. But for me here in the UK, no one wanted to write about me. Not mm-hmm. me. Again, let's scrap that. No one wanted to write mm-hmm. about Palestinian food when I mm-hmm. was writing about it because mm-hmm. it was um, kind of uncool. No one had done it before. And, mm-hmm. you know, how can they write about a country that isn't existing? Do I mm-hmm. really exist? I was born in Syria. Am I really Palestinian? You know, they made me mm-hmm. feel like I doubted my own identity. Mm-hmm. And I called my parents. I was like, what are they saying? This is what's happening. And my dad mm-hmm. was like, Baba. You mm-hmm. are from Safad and mm-hmm. Elit and this is it. No one can tell you anything. I was like, <laughs> oh, but they're telling me this and that. And he, you know, I yeah. can't say what he said, but you can imagine what he yeah. said. Uh, and, and um, you know, it, it was so distressing mm-hmm. to see that you were just sort of deleted um, from, mm-hmm. from, from existence. Someone decided that because of what happened in 1948 and 45 and before, mm-hmm you don't have an identity so yeah. we kind of changed that you know mm-hmm. we there was a, a fantastic Iranian chef who wrote a Palestinian book called Zaytun mm-hmm. and, um, I hosted her in my restaurant yeah yeah, in Khan. yeah she's fantastic. Yeah. and her book was good but it's not very authentically Palestinian at all it's like a Jamie traveler Oliver. and again, again yeah it's, it's a travel a book him yeah it's a person who's not Palestinian coming to the country writing a book a Jamie Oliver kind of book on Palestine and yeah she got so much credit for writing it they said to her like they'd given her the baton of Anthony Bourdain and I read her book and I loved it by the way mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. You know what yeah she has great writing but it's not authentic Palestinian food it's a westerners view on what it was and my friends were messaging me saying, hey, Yasmin Khan is in LA Times. She's, oh, she's in the New York Times or she's in the Chicago Mobile Fish. I don't know what. And the yeah. Guardian and the Standard. And, and I said to them, she's not Palestinian. That's why. Mm-hmm. Because Yeah, she's less th- a little less threatening, right? You're less biased. Yeah. You're less of a threat. You're yeah. not um, delegitimizing Israel. Always, every single time yeah. I have a journalist ask me, oh, but how do we put you in the context of Israel? Well, what's I ironic mean, about Yasmin? To be she, this, she, we need that to be this. We can be just us without Israel. And in the end, I just got so bored. I thought, like, <laughs> I don't really care anymore. So yeah. I just, answering the question, uh, Reem, it's like, I'm just me. And if you need to connect me with Israel every single time I write a recipe, then I'm kind of yeah. done. With this. Um, yeah. I don't have anything to say. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, what's ironic is that Yasmin was part of the BDS movement. She actually has a political background, but yeah. this like this pressure to depoliticize Palestinian food is is very real, right? 
they want us as long as we sort of keep it PG. And I think people like me and you are not going to keep it PG, Palestine. <laughs> well, <I'll>, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, there's a there's two interesting questions I think are kind of connected. Um, one around sort of um, engaging people. How how do we navigate conversations to help educate people around the normalization of the narratives that food have been mainstreamed as Israeli here in the US. Um, and never normalize that, that's my answer. Yeah, but how do we navigate, yeah, but you know, to someone I think like who just ne didn't, doesn't know anything about Palestine, you know, yeah. and doesn't, uh, doesn't actually, like there are people who are just, they're not in the know. Um, mm. How do we start to engage conversations the other question, and I think this is related to um, my comment about the gastro -dipro diplomacy programs, is that are we in conversations with chefs that are being invited for these food programs? Um, they may not realize they're being used. And we see this, right? Like we saw in the NFL, um, Michael Bennett, for instance. I don't know if you know him. He uh, I, was a it. player for the, yeah. And he did a lot of reading and realized, oh, I'm being used as a tool to normalize. I'm not going to go on this trip. Um, I had the very, um, the privilege to be part of a, uh, a, a widespread campaign against a very prominent chef, uh, Gabrielle Hamilton, who mm. was the owner and chef of Prune in New York. And she was going to go on this delegation and she's a well-respected chef. And we got, I think, over 50 chefs around the country to sign on to imploring her not to go. It was a farm to table uh, yeah. event uh, like how ironic that Israel is hosting farm to table events when they're raising the farms right next door to them um, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say but, the same. <laughs> but she she uh, she didn't love it she didn't love being put on the spot but uh but she she did not go you know and we were able every year for them and they canceled that event for this year you know and so we know that that is an impact that we're having yeah. huh being put on the spot is uncomfortable but you have yeah. to swallow this sometimes and yeah but these are moments that we can engage people and yeah I guess you know for me I've always sort of I just not necessarily stay in my lane but I speak my truth right I uh, I'm not there to combat every single thing that comes my way but I'm there to for every cl cl uh, claiming of Israeli, I'm claiming Palestinian louder, right? <laughs> and it's not for jockeying of ownership. That's not really what I'm doing, but I'm just no, speaking the truth to power. Yeah. yeah, what you can do also, you know, a lot, I get so many messages like, oh, you see this and that and this and that. I'm like, listen, I'm just one person. This is not on my shoulders. I am a chef. Yes. First and foremost. I happen to be Palestinian, thank God, because I love it. Um, but <laughs> I, I did not take this responsibility to save Palestine and I'm trying to do what I yeah. can, but I'm just one human. Yeah. Um, but the, you know, the chef that you were talking about, it's uncomfortable to be put in the spotlight of something that is so important in history. And some people, like you said, might not know what's going on and you have to educate them. I remember working so I lost my business in, in February 10th, 2013. I started working in a property company, which was okay. And um, a year and a half into it, so it's 2014, Ramadan time, summer, I think it was summertime. And then Israel started bombing Gaza. So I'm sitting in an office and wearing my skirt and my heels and my jacket. And I'm watching the news of Gaza being bombed into a million pieces and my boss was screaming at me and I'm in an open office with 40 people and I'm watching I'm just like dripping tears quietly on my computer and he just slammed the table like what the hell are you doing I said to him listen I don't give a crap what you're saying right now my country is being blitzed to smithereens right now mm -hmm. I thought you were from Jordan I said to him, no, because everyone tries to make you from somewhere else, right? When they don't know totally. where you're from. <laughs> Lebanon. Lebanese is the, like the, my go-to. Palestine. <laughs> Palestine. And then he said to me, get up on the, my, our desks were like one big desk. So there was like 20 people on each side. So I stood, he said, get up on the desk and tell everyone what's happening in Palestine and then switch off this 
stupid news that you're watching because you're driving me crazy. So I got up and I started telling, and then there was this huge demonstration that weekend and we worked on weekends. And I was just like, by the way, I'm not coming to work. And if you're going to fire me, no problem. Um, going to the demonstration, not that it even saved Palestine or Gaza at this point, but <laughs> more body count mattered. Yeah. And I yeah. stood up and nobody, no, we live in London. London is like the hub of the world, right? Like New York and Paris and what have you. Nobody knew where Palestine was. You know how upset I was, <laughs> traumatized. Mm-hmm. And they're just like, where is this country? I'm like, do you know where Israel is? Like, yes, we know. I was like, that's Palestine. And I started going, he gave me five minutes to give like the whole history of Palestine. Mm, And I was like, anyone want to this demonstration? And he was like, no, that's not why I told you to stand up. I said to you, just tell everybody what's happening in the news. Mm -hmm. And then everybody joined me in this demonstration in this in this march that was happening and he was Mm -hmm. obviously so happy with me because no one came to work Mm -hmm. but it was so important and I was just shocked that you know these people who live in the center of London did not know what was happening in Palestine you had journalists having nervous breakdowns who were crying on live tv do you remember I can't remember his Mm -hmm. name uh he literally burst into tears with his press outfit and his Mm -hmm. helmet and he just walked off screen. And I said to him, this is what's happening to grown men who are white, British. Imagine mm-hmm. what's happening to Palestinian people living on the land. Children. You know? And yeah. he, you know, my, obviously he, he got it eventually. And I said, to him, I'm not gonna stop watching the news while I'm at work. So <laughs> this is yeah. how it goes. Yeah. And it's really just about, again, this kind of, drifted off but comes back to just re-educating people about reality because we're so um uh what's the word it's we're just closed off and we're numb and no one really cares anymore because we all have our own issues mentally emotionally uh mortgages and family and divorces and whatever that these things become so like on the outer level of life that they don't matter Mm -hmm. but they really do they really do and we these people count on us to help whether it's through a food parcel or $40 uh, from Mecca or, you know, from my book. I like that slip. <laughs> yeah, but it's true. But it's yeah, true. Yeah, it's true. Michelle Meshebek from, from Interlink Books, he decided from the beginning that all my books or my two books would be donating money to charity mm-hmm. from every single sale. And that mm-hmm. money rebuilt and uh, fixed up a whole school in Nablus I didn't even know. Awesome. You know he told me when it happened he's like by the way do you know that we sold this many books and this much money and this money made this happen and this school was renovated and I was mm-hmm. in tears I didn't know and we we need to do that we need to support and help it in any way we're not here to like save Palestine but we can save mm-hmm. bit by bit by bit by mm-hmm. bit and other people and there's so many and it takes and it takes all of us. I mean, I think this is a it's really a amazing, you know, well, one, just an amazing note to end on is that, you know, one somebody in the comments, actually, she paraphrased Audre Lord. She's saying, our silence is not going to protect us, right? And so many of our communities have been um, feared into silence. We've been taught to not tell our stories. And sometimes simply telling our stories is a gateway, right? And so, you know, not just Palestinians, but all of our supporters, the folks who are watching this, there's a reason that compelled you to watch this, right? And to hear this conversation is that we all have a role to play in the various sectors that we live in, right? What is the role that we play, um, especially those of us who are in the West, living in the bellies of the beast, our taxpayer dollars going to support this apartheid state? Um, All of us have a role to play in denormalizing that. It could be a simple act of, you know, if you're eating uh, at a restaurant with somebody and somebody says Israeli couscous, you know, asking some questions about that. Do you know where that term comes from? I mean, it could be as simple as that. Um, You know, supporting supporting programs with your money, your time, your resources. um, All of these are going to help. So... You know, it, it's going to take all of us, not just Palestinians, to speak on behalf of all Palestinians. But I feel so fortunate that we are in a position to pave the way, to continue to tell our stories and to inspire other people to join. 
and yeah. telling those stories. And let us have our own voice to talk about ourselves and stop giving the and stop giving the mic to other people who have not lived our experience. You know, I've never been to Palestine because I'm not allowed, but that doesn't take away the fact that my blood is, I did a DNA test, you know, these 23 <laughs> people, whatever it's called. I am like 87% from Palestine and the rest is yeah. Greek, Spanish and whatever, yeah. you know, because cross cultural yeah. things, yeah. but that's a lot. I thought, I, I read that if you're more than 60% of something, then you are that thing. Um, mm. So 87% being from there, but then being told here by a white guy who's never been to Palestine, but is writing in a magazine, oh, you're not really Palestinian because you're not authentic and you've never been there. And you, mm -hmm. But my friend, I speak Arabic. I eat Palestinian food. I live Palestine. I breathe it. My parents are talking about it all the time. And then to have some random person give the voice and we have to stop doing that and making it acceptable and also not to dehumanize people who get given that role because it's not their fault it's just to respect other people and really embrace where they come from it doesn't have to be just palestinian but obviously it is because yeah. we're talking about this today it can be from any country and and really recognizing where people are from where they come from who they are their inner being and giving them that platform to speak um mm -hmm. i'm so tired of kind of being silenced mm -hmm. uh, even though i'm not because i have the luxury of this beautiful phone uh and my instagram page which is the only thing i don't have facebook or twitter because i don't know how to use them but <laughs> i can see what i want and if one person wants to listen great if no one does fantastic but we we have to we have to kind of fight against what's happening because it's not okay and to pretend that it is is not doing anyone any favors and we have so much to give you know i cannot wait to see your book i hope your book you. blasts through <laughs> out and you know you'll get so much uh, resistance from for it but yeah my advice to you is don't let it get to you because it's we're uh, doing something right yeah. <laughs> yeah. when you well, have the haters you're doing something right that's always yeah. <laughs> wherever the haters come from if yeah. they're Africa, Palestinian, yeah. Palestinian yeah. whatever it doesn't matter you just got to believe in yourself trust your gut and and don't let anyone kind of bring you down because we're doing something I didn't do anything for anything in the beginning I wrote a book because I love my mom Honestly, that's the only reason Palestine on a Plate existed because I am obsessed with my mother. I love her. I love all my aunties. They were all my mothers. And then when it became a different thing and a political thing and Palestine, oh my God, no, no, no. I just thought, oh my goodness, what have I done? Uh, <laughs> and I wasn't prepared for it because I thought everyone's yeah. going to think it's a cute book, like yeah. a love story to mama. And actually that's not what happened. It was yeah. who girl and what is she saying and palestine doesn't exist and we're going to crush her mm -hmm. uh, and they did they crushed me and they stepped on me and i came but back you came back stronger yeah, yeah. Because you have to and you know why because we're palestinian and we're strong and we're resilient right. samud <laughs> samud it's in our blood you know this yeah. is part of our purpose and we will continue That's fighting and <laughs> <laughs> and what a delicious struggle so for those who don't have judy's books definitely is there an interlink uh where where can they get your book what's the best way on interlink or on amazon or jackie small wherever you want to get them they're literally available everywhere and you yeah doing, any particular purchase you get yeah these are giving are giving back and again you know i was saying to reem she's not going to make a penny from these books like myself <laughs> not about our own indulgence in finances no. it's more about giving Telling and, us out there. and our jobs keep us alive yeah. these books are yeah. more of a thank you to the world and our families and really unless you're jamie oliver or yotam otelengi you ain't making <laughs> <laughs> That is a good note to end on. Thank you all for a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, I hope to stay connected. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I'm there. Yeah. Thanks too. for asking. <laughs> all right, y'all. Thank you guys for joining. It was so nice to 
speak at you for the last two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you All enjoyed right. the conversation and please support Mecca and Reem's book when it comes out next year. Yes, and my 2022, book. spring 2022. Oh, Look out. The Palestinians out there, yes. we have to support each other and keep a community going. So yes. thank you so much. Take care. Bye. Bye.